you loved us, that you loved me. <coughs> help us to be dwelling in that love and help us to grow in that love so that love would be complete and help us to share that love with others. We are thankful for all you have done and all you will do. And we ask that you'll continue to love us as we open our hearts and our spirit to your words and your words only. And may your words be lifted on high and mine go away. May the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be worthy in front of you, our Lord. We thank you and pray this all in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. <coughs> <clears throat> welcome to our worship service and I wanted to welcome everyone who is joining us here uh, visitors and newcomers who had joined us may the love of Jesus Christ be filled in your life and as we are here we are sure and we believe that Christ had, is, is doing something and also the Christ and the spirit of God is going to be filled in us so may you be blessed as we continue to follow our Lord. And if you're also joining us in our uh, online worship, we pray that the same blessing will be upon you. Make sure that you uh, fill out the attendance so we will be able to be accountable with one another. And as we start this day, and as you, uh, we're starting into a three-part sermon series about what true love is and how we can tru truly love others, I wanted to start with what is the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to become a blessing to others so all will be able to see the love of Jesus Christ. It also actually starts with Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, where God calls Abraham and says, I am going to bless you and make your name on high so you can become a blessing to all nations. And in that, what we do in, a, in, a, in, the, in the church, we continue on that mission of loving God and loving others for the transformation of the world and as Methodists we are making disciples for the transformation of the world so we do have this purpose that we need to hold on to and whenever the church loses that purpose there's no reason why the church should exist if we fail to love God and love others for the transformation of the world there's no more reason for us to gather but as long as we hold on to that purpose God will continue to use us in God's mission. And that is the reason why we invite you to Rally Day because Rally Day is that time where we rally around the purpose of God, the purpose that God gave to this church starting 95 years ago and will continue on. And we rally around not only because it is a beginning of fall and it is a time where we bring back people from the summer of their... Uh, I didn't want to say sporadic attendance, but it is more about, it's more about being passionate and rekindled by the purpose. And starting last year, what we did is we started to compartmentalize this purpose and we started with loving God. When God had loved us first, what we need to do is we need to love God back in a way of our personal worship and our public worship and our reading and our prayer. It is a way that we develop a love language with our Lord. And as we cycle back for my second rally day here at this church, we want to continue to focus on to how we love others. And our loving others can, can go on in a way of missions. But before we go on into the world, I wanted to focus on making sure that our love of our brothers and sisters in this church and this community of faith continues to grow so it can overflow into this world. So in the next two weeks, we're going to go and build this sermon series on two, starting with what true love is and how we can love others and how we can grow in perfection of this love. Because there's one thing. People outside the world are still searching for the true meaning of love. We are living in a, in a society where we are now natural of sharing I love you, Saying I love you is something that is more common. 
compared to the culture that I come from, y'all say I love you more often than I can ever imagine. And we are in a way where we are searching for that love, but the question is, do the people truly understand what true love is? Sometimes we say that we love, but despite of all our actions and our practice of saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, how many love do we really see in this world? Or do we see more hatred? Especially in these times of tension. So in order for us to really experience, and in order for us to really share that love, what we need to do, we need to share the love that can only be defined as true love. And that love, the best way to find that love is to find it in God. Because God himself is the origin of love. God and the, God, the love that God has shown through His Son, Jesus Christ, is the only love that we can hold on to and the only love that can bring life into this world. And the question is, do we, as Christians, as believers of Christ, do we really hold on to that true love? So we're going to start with one of the books of the Bible which is called the first John and the epistles of John that is called the love epistles epistles John himself was a person who constantly said in his gospel that he was the beloved disciple he had always made sure that he was recognized to be the beloved disciple and then we also know that in, in disciples, Jesus' disciple, there was a core group of Peter, John, and James. And those are the ones who always were with Jesus. And particularly from the Gospel of John, John says that I was the one who was beloved because he's the one who went to, the, uh, went to Jesus in the Last Supper and he said he was the beloved one. He's the one who actually ends the Gospel of John kind of putting himself in a pedestal that, saying that I was loved. In a way, he, as he was loved, he also wants to do this. He wants to share that love with others. So that's the reason why we believe that First John, Second John, and Third John is more of a love epistle. But we always know, have to go a little bit more deeper why this book was written. Because this was not written out of love. This was actually written out of John correcting the people and making sure that they remain in love. At the time in John, when he had built a church and planted a church in minor Asia, what happened is, after he left, there were people, a group of people who came and started dividing the church with different messages. They were called as a cult. And John had to direct their people, his people, and saying that you need to drive them out. Because if they are not sharing the message that is from God, that message will kill you. And after you cut them away from you, you have to make sure that you start building and you start holding on and reaffirming that your community, community is built around the love that only comes from God. And when that love is overflowing, you'll see how that love will continue to flow into the world. That's the background of First John that we had read. So if we see in uh, the beginning of the verse of chapter 4 that we didn't read, it says, My dear friends, don't believe everything you hear. Carefully weigh and examine what people tell you. Not everyone who talks about God comes from God. There are a lot of lying preachers loose in the world. And this has to be a discernment that every single believer has. Starting with me, don't rely on every single word that I say because sometimes the word that comes out of my mouth can be something that comes out of my own flesh. And I had learned that a lot of times things that I, I, I say in my own flesh are the ones that can, pe that can easily hurt people. Start from the discernment from me. As I discern what God's word is while I prepare for the sermon, I also believe that our members and the children of God who are listening to the sermon has to discern what God's will is instead of what Rajay's word is. So please, come with that kind of discernment about my word. That's the reason why I say, Lord, let your word be shared and not my words. 
Sometimes I even say, Lord, may your words be lifted on high instead of mine just being cast away. That's the reason why I start my sermon with, Lord, may the meditation of my, may the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be worthy only in front of you, not in front of others. Because we all need to have that discernment. Not only for preachers, not only in the church, you also have to need to have that discernment in the world. Because the message that we hear from the world can be something that is totally different from what the message of God is presenting to us. And we need to have that discernment of what is the message of God and what is not. I talked about the obvious threat of our enemy. Sometimes we, we do not want to talk about evil. We don't want to talk about Satan. But it is true that Satan will continue to want us to have us fall down. And there are always this obvious threat that comes into our life through a difficult event. It will be a difficult situation. It will try to bog us down. And there's no doubt that Satan is trying to put us down. But what about the inconspicuous threats? Oh, Lord, I got a new vocabulary written on my inconspicuous thread. The ones that are so subtle that we don't even know that it is a threat. Have we ever been discerning about those messages that are not from God in that way? Last Wednesday, I had a, a meet down breakfast meeting with our downtown group, and we talked about this uh, inconspicuous threat and how the culture can slowly kill us. And I used this uh, analogy from cooking frogs. And I know that cooking frogs or eating frogs is not something that American culture is uh, aware of, but it is something that uh, a lot of Asian countries do. And I did a little bit more research. And it turns out that France eats frogs uh, as well. And South American and a lot of European countries eat it as well. So it's not that weird. And it's still, it is going to be weird. Now, the reason why I am talking about this frog food is not because I wanted to gross anybody out. But I wanted to talk about the way how they cook it. So what they do is they cook all the frogs and they clean it up. And what they do, they put it into this pot and put it into the water temperature that is very cool for the frogs to be comfortable in. So they put it in the frog and the frogs are swimming around, right? And they like the temperature. And the person who is cooking the frog food turns on the light and the light heats up the water. Now, I said that the, water, uh, the, in, the frogs, after they feel that the water is warm and hot, getting hot, I said that they, 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 they try to jump out, so that's the reason why the lid is on and you know, <clears throat> the, uh, in order to prevent all the frogs to jump around. But my wife said, no, you're wrong. You don't even have to put the lids on because the frogs will slowly die in that hot water. Doesn't that sound like the culture and the message of the world that conspicuously threatens us and kills us? And if we do not have that discernment of what is coming from God and what is not, don't we think, don't, can't we say that we can also die and we can be dead in that culture? And that's why I had the song that kept on ringing my head and sometimes you just have to sing it and that's when I, when I saw this and I saw the message and I heard that and I was like killing me softly with his song killing me softly with him killing me softly with his song killing me softly with his word saying my that's the way that we can die if we do not have that discernment and John is saying discern what is from God? And what is from God? What is from God is only the true love. And this is the true love that John is trying to share with the people who has experienced this hatred and also devastation. From verse 7 it says, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And in this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning, atoning sacrifice for our sins. In this culture, as we live, we actually have a problem of mixing up all these meanings of love. And we think that love is all the same. And in a way, we say that we love, we love, and we love, but the, the fact is that we do not really love. So that's the reason why in our discernment, what we need to do, we need to love, know and understand the different meanings of love. And there, according to the Greek philosophy and Greek uh culture, Hellenistic culture, at the time that John was writing this, there are four types of love, and there is a specific love that John is describing. The first one, according to the Greek philosophy, is the eros love. And eros love would be something that we are passionate, intense love that arouses among romantic relations. That's a, a love that uh, two people will romantically start loving each other. That's a ero er erotic eros love. And then there's a filial love, which is more of a love and a, refers to affection and a warmth and a tender uh, companionship. Sometimes it could be described of more of a love of friendship. And then there's a storage love, which is a kind of a family and a, and a love that comes in our family. This is the love that parents naturally feel toward their children. The love that members of the family have for each other. Well, this is different from the ungiving, uh, unconditional love that God has. And the last one would be the love that we all know, the agape love, the unconditional love of accepting people ha as they are. And God himself had died on the cross because God wanted to show that unconditional love. The threat of this culture is that we mix things all up. And we say that, we use that unconditional love in such a way that is different from the way of God. But God says this agape love is the perfect love, that unconditional love. And whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. <coughs> Meaning that this love is that unconditional love who does not love in a way that God loved people. John is saying, you might not know God at all. Because if you love God, and if you know God, if you were loved by God, you are able, you are able to love others in a way that God loved you. The passage actually continues on in verse 11 by saying, Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Now, let me just pause here for a second. It is for us to be perfected in this agape love. Even though we receive that love, our love might not be perfected. In a way, we need to learn how to have this unconditional love like God had loved us. And it is only possible when we are accepting that spirit to come in us and that spirit to abide in us and that spirit to grow us. The verse actually continues on, on verse uh, 14, by saying, And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. What does this mean? How can we really share and how can we really abide and dwell in this agape love? It could be rather simple. It is by accepting the love that is from God. And it is accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. And that is something that we should all be believing 
But at the same time, that is something that we tend to forget in a way. That I had a joke about last week when we talked about the four spiritual laws. Is this something that we don't hear this because it's only shared in the Baptist church? How many times have you heard in this church that if you die today, are you sure that you will be with God? If we do not have that concrete in our belief, that we do not have that accepted, that love that is so divinely majestic, majest, majestic, not accepted in our lives, how can we say that we truly abide in that love? That love that sought out for us, even though we had disregarded it. The love that has sought out for us, even though sometimes we might have ignored or rejected. Even the love that sought out for us, even did we, that we did not ask for it. That love continued to follow us. The love continued to reach out to us. And the love was nothing that we can earn, but it was something that was given as a gift. And when we say, Lord, thank you for your love. That love abides in us. And the love starts growing in us. But the thing is, that love does not grow by itself. It only grows when we come together as a believer and a community of faith. John says in verse 17, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reject, reached perfection in love. Let me pause here for a second. I talked about fear and how fear has been a stumbling block for a lot of Christians to live in this li life as a light of the world. And I asked if we could be victorious. And the reason why we can live this victorious life is one thing, because of the love has been perfected in our lives. John says there is no fear in love. And by any chance, if we are capsulated by the fear because of the message that is given to us through the world, that we did not discern what comes from God, but instead just accepted what comes from the world, what happens is our love cannot grow, and our love not growing cannot reach that perfection. And what happens is we continue to dwell in that fear. But what if we accept that love and help uh, able that love to grow in us? We will see how all those fear casts away and how the fear not only casts away that we can actually live in this world in victory. And that does not happen by ourselves. That does not happen alone. It happens with one another. That's why it says... On verse 19 to 21, we love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and their sisters. What it means is that love only becomes growing and perfected as we love one another. As we love others outside in the world, but also love others in this church. I do have to say our ultimate goal is to love others outside in the world. And that is a question that I keep on asking myself. Can I really love those people? I constantly go out to Grandin, Grandin area and I want to go more and more. And I see all these people who are different from me. And I ask, Lord, can I really love them? That's probably the reason why two months ago when we st I started playing Pokemon, I started as an interest of trying to 
say hi to all the Pokemon players, but it turned out to be a practice that I love so much that I'm just standing out there with my wife and I'm waving to all these people and they're like, why is that Asian person waving at me? Some people ignore me and some people just react by waving back at me. I should have a sign saying, just have a blessed day and I'm just passing out a smile because that is my way of asking, Lord, how can I love these people? But the question always starts, and the solution always starts, not only reaching out, but actually inside here. Can we really love each other with the agape love that we had experienced? And as a matter of fact, if we start loving each other in that way, that love that abides in us, what happens is we are growing in perfection of that love. Now this is going to be the end of my sermon for today because I'm not going to tell you about how we grow in this love until next week. I'm going to give that little hang in there to be continued so everyone will come back next Sunday regardless of that Bristol game, one of the biggest college football games in history, whatever it is. Are you willing to grow in that love but are you willing to do it with one another and are you willing to do it starting here to reach out to the world that is our question and when we answer that question we will be able to say Lord we are able to rally around your purpose of loving you loving others for the transformation of the world and that would be the reason why we still exist here as a faith community. So it is important that God renews that love. And it is important that that love grows in us every single day. So are you ready to grow with us? Let us have a time of prayer. Lord, grow us in your love and perfect us that all perfect love will cast out any kind of fear that we have in this world. And as we continue to grow in this perfection, Lord, help us to share this love with others. The love that comes from you and the love that is everlasting. We thank you. And we pray this all in your name, Jesus Christ.